Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where if you came to learn Python, the coding language, you're in the wrong room. That is going on somewhere else. But if you came to learn about pythons and other amazing snakes, you come to the exact right place and you may just find your next Halloween costume as we get up close and personal with some of these sensational serpents, including one of our guest stars of today. But before that, I want to introduce you to your star for today. Ashlyn is live at Wonders of Wildlife in Missouri, where we're going to investigate all kinds of amazing snakes, find out what you know about them, learn some fun new facts, and even meet one live and on screen. Couple things you guys know, some snakes bite, Ashlyn definitely doesn't, which means please use the chat box to the right of the screen. She's gonna ask you some questions to find out what you know and want to know about snakes so you can answer those there. And if you have any questions whatsoever, toward the end of the program, I'm gonna interview Ashlyn with your questions to get you some answers. So please don't hesitate, ask questions if you have them and uh, we'll get them answered toward the end of the show. But we got plenty of amazing things to do before that starts. So let me turn it over to your instructor for today, Ashlyn at Johnny Morris's Wonders of Wildlife. Hey guys, like Brian said, my name is Ashlyn and I'm a lead educator over at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. Uh, of course, today we're talking about snakes. So here is a picture of me with one of my favorite snakes that I get to work with all the time. Uh, his name is Toro. He is a bull snake, which is the largest species of snake that we have here in Missouri where I live. So Toro is one of many animals that we have here at the aquarium, and we have a whole bunch of animals. So we have everything from sharks to alligators to even bears. So now that you guys know a little bit about me and Wonders of Wildlife, um, I want to get to know you guys a little bit. So just like Brian said earlier, there will be some times throughout our lesson that we will have some questions for you. Um, and I want you guys to use your chat box to share your answers with me. So to get to know you guys a little bit better, I want you to share with me what your favorite animal is. So we're gonna practice using our chat boxes and I want, to, I want you to tell me what your favorite animal is. So I'll give you guys just a minute to get that typed out. What is your favorite animal? All right, I think I'm starting to see some answers roll in. I see penguins, sharks, sharks are amazing, spiders, Hummingbirds, those guys are pretty cool. Elephants, lions, those are good answers. Yep, so those are all really amazing animals. And I think I even saw some people mention snakes too. So I don't know about you guys, but I am ready to get started talking about snakes. Are you guys ready? I hope you're ready. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and get started. So before we dive into the details of snakes, First, we kind of want to look at the big picture. So snakes belong to a group of animals called reptiles. So really quickly, we're going to look at some things that all reptiles have in common. So reptiles are ectothermic or cold-blooded. Um, they are vertebrates, which means that they have a backbone. They have scales on their body. They lay eggs and they have lungs that they use to breathe. So I know most of us have seen a reptile at some point or another. So I want you guys to tell me what are some examples of reptiles that you know of, or maybe some reptiles you've seen before. So go ahead and use your chat box and tell me what are some reptiles that you know about, or maybe some reptiles you've seen before. I'll give you just a minute to type, get that in your chat box. Let's see if we can start getting some answers in here. All right, let's see. I see turtles. Those are reptiles, good job. Tortoises, yep. Snakes, of course they're reptiles, amazing. Lizards, geckos, crocodiles. Yep, you guys really know your reptiles. You guys are doing great. So um, here we can see there are a lot of different types of reptiles. So snakes, lizards, turtles, tortoises, alligators, crocodiles, and even sea turtles. Those are some examples of reptiles. So since snakes are reptiles, we're gonna run through all those reptile characteristics that we just looked at. And we're gonna take a look at how snakes will fit into the reptile category. So to start off, snakes are ectothermic. So remember that means they're cold blooded, right? So this means that they cannot maintain their own body heat. They rely on their surroundings or their environment to keep their body at the right temperature. This is very different from how our bodies operate. So us humans, our bodies are able to regulate their own temperature. So this means that when we get too cold or too hot, our body has systems in place that help bring us back to the right temperature. So for example, when you get cold, what normally happens to your body? Think about it for a second. What normally happens to your body when you get really cold? 
So you might chatter your teeth a little bit. Uh, I know when I get cold, my teeth really chatter a lot. Um, you might shiver a little bit, so you might start shaking a little, or you might even get goosebumps on your arms, right? So those are all ways that your body helps keep you warm. Um, what about when you get too hot? What does your body do when you get too hot? Think about it for a second. I have an answer. Do you guys have an answer? All right, cool. So most of us, if we get too hot, we will sweat, right? This is our body's way of cooling us down and trying to get that heat out of our body through our sweat. So reptiles, like snakes, they don't have any of these things um, if their body temperature gets too high or too low. So if you were a snake, the best way for you to stay warm is actually to find a really sunny spot like a rock, and you're going to soak in all the heat from the sun, just like you can see in the picture there. So this is often called sunning or basking. Um, what do you think, if you were a snake, what would you do if you got too cold? What do you think you would do? Think about it for a second. I don't know. If, I don't know about you guys, but if I got too cold, I would probably maybe try to find, or not too cold, too hot. What am I saying? <laughs> if you got too hot, you'd probably find a burrow underground, um, or you'd move to a shady spot where you can stay out of the sun so you don't get too overheated, right? Um, the next thing we know about snakes, we're going to move on here, is that they are vertebrates. So this means that they have backbones. So in the picture here, um, this is actually a picture of a snake's backbone. Um, and we can tell it's kind of long when compared to a human's backbone. I'm sure you guys already know this, but snakes don't have any legs, which means that their spine is super duper long and it reaches all the way from their skull, all the way at the top, all the way towards the tip of their tail. So I actually brought a snake skeleton with me today so you guys can see. Um, it's a whole snake skeleton. Let's see if maybe we can zoom in on that so you guys can see it a little bit better. Scoot it back. There we go. And we can tell that the spine on this snake skeleton reaches all the way down the length of the snake's body. So each segment on the spine that we see um, is called a vertebrae. So snakes can have anywhere between 200 to 400 vertebrae on their spines. And it really just depends on what snake species we're talking about. Um, so to put that into perspective for you guys, we humans only have 33 vertebra in our spines. So something else very unique about snakes is that they have two ribs attached to just about every one of their vertebrae, which means that if a snake has 200 vertebrae or segments in their spine, they could have up to 400 ribs. I don't know about you guys, but I think that's pretty crazy. So snakes use all of those ribs to help give their body support. It helps to protect their internal organs. And then also it kind of helps to get them around. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about, we're going to move on, is we're going to talk about scales. So the picture that you see is a very close-up picture of some snake scales. So scales help to protect the snake's body from its environment. And it also allows snakes to live in dry or hot places because those scales can help to retain moisture in the snake's body. So the scales um, on snakes and other reptiles are made out of keratin, which is the same material that our hair and our fingernails are made of. Um, other reptiles like lizards also have keratin scales and turtles and tortoises have keratin scales on their shells. So um, while we're talking about scales, I have a question for you guys. What is something cool that snakes and other reptiles can do with their scales? So I'll say that again. What is something that reptiles can do with their scales? And I'll give you a hint. Um, snakes do this several times a year. What is something cool that snakes can do with their scales or reptiles? So go ahead and tell me in your chat box, if you're not already, type in. Go ahead and start typing and tell me what something they can do with those scales. I'm already seeing some answers. You guys are on it. Look at you. Let's see. A lot of us are starting to get it. Yep. Amazing. I'm seeing a lot of right answers. Awesome. You guys are great. Look at you guys. So snakes can shed their skin, right? So snakes will shed their skin as they grow and as they get bigger because their body will not fit into the same scales forever, right? Because as they get older, they're going to grow bigger, right? So in order for their bodies to grow bigger, they have to shed off the older scales that are smaller and they will grow some new ones underneath that will help make sure that they can fit into their body, right? So in this picture, you can see um, it's actually a snake shedding its skin. I think it's a really awesome picture. Um, and the really cool thing about shedding is that snake sheds will almost always come off in one piece. 
So I actually brought a snake shed with me today. I'll hold it up so you guys can see. Maybe. I'll have to unroll it first. It's a really big one. I'll show you the top because that's what I think is the coolest part of it. So we can see all of those old scales that have come off of the snake and they have shed it off. We'll see if we can get all the way to the bottom of our shed here. There it is. It's a really, really big shed. This one is from a black rat snake that we have here at the aquarium. I'll go ahead and set that back down. There we go. Cool. <laughs> so uh, we kind of got to see how big that shed was. And we also got to see that it was in one piece, right? So a fun fact for you guys is that um, snakes actually have a clear scale over their eye that will come off with their shed, which is really cool. So when you look at a snake shed up close, you can very, very clearly see the face. So you can see their nostrils. And then you can also see those clear scales that were over the eyes, which is really cool. Um, another thing that we know about snakes, we're going to move forward here, is that snakes actually lay eggs, which is pretty awesome. Most snakes do anyways. Uh, when adult snakes lay their eggs, they don't typically stay by the nest to protect those eggs, which is kind of different from some other animals that we know that lay eggs like birds, right? So snakes can be pretty vulnerable to predators um, like birds, small mammals and raccoons and coyotes, and then sometimes even other reptiles. So when they hatch out of their eggs, they're pretty independent and they go out on the into the world on their own. Um, and some species of snakes, when they hatch, they'll be the size of a pencil. Um, others will be super duper tiny, like the size of an earthworm. It really depends on what species it is. But regardless of their size, when they hatch, um, they are really, really vulnerable to predators. And they're very commonly preyed upon by other animals. And that also goes for when they are still eggs as well. They are... Um, Definitely a pretty yummy snack for a lot of other animals. But luckily, snakes have some pretty great camouflage most of the time that can help them to blend into their surroundings and stay safe from those predators. Um, we are going to go ahead and move on. But the last characteristic that snakes have that tells us that they're reptiles is that they have lungs. So even our sea snake friends that live in the oceans have lungs and they breathe air. So snakes breathe air through their nose, but they cannot breathe through their mouth which may be kind of surprising considering that we see them moving their tongue all the time. Um, when we see snakes do this, they're actually smelling. Did you guys know that? So when you see a snake moving their tongue out of their mouth, that means that they're smelling. Um, they can use their tongues to catch scent particles around them and they pull them into their mouth where they have a very specialized organ called a Jacobson's organ. Um, this organ helps to send those scents to the brain and it helps the brain to decipher what those scents might be. So the reason that snakes smell like this is because it really helps them to nail down where their prey is, since this method of smelling is a lot stronger than if they were to try to smell with their nose. So all the things we just talked about are some things that tell us that snakes are reptiles. But I have a question for you guys. This may be kind of tricky, so I'll say it a couple different ways. What makes a snake a snake? So what makes snakes so special from other reptiles? Um, how do we know that when we're looking at a reptile that it's a snake? I want you to tell me in your chat box, how do we know that a reptile is a snake? I'm gonna give you guys a minute to think on this one and a minute to type. We'll see what you guys come up with. All right. Thinking, it looks like I'm starting to get some anthers rolling in here. Yep, I see a lot of good answers. I see a lot of correct answers. You guys are on a roll. You guys are already snake experts. Yep, looks like a lot of us have got it. Yep. So snakes don't have any legs. Good job, guys. You guys got it. So other than snakes, there are only a few other reptiles that don't have any limbs or legs, um, including our friend, the legless lizard. So it can be kind of difficult to tell them apart when we look at them, um, especially apart, but if we put them side to side or side by side. There are a couple of pretty key differences that we can see. Um, one really big difference is that legless lizards have eyelids and snakes do not. Um, legless lizards also have ear holes and snakes don't. So in the pictures here, 
We can see our friend on the left is a snake because it does not have any eyelids and it does not have any ear holes. So if you look really, really close at his face, we don't see any eyelids, we don't see any ear holes. Um, our friend on the right is a legless lizard and we can tell that because he has eyelids and ear holes. So that's how we can tell he's a legless lizard. So if you look at them side by side, they do look pretty different. Um, you guys ready to move on? All right, cool. So now that we know some snake basics, we are going to talk about some snake species. So I have a lot of amazing snake species to share with you guys today. And in order for us to get a pretty good understanding of the characteristics of these specific snake species, kind of a mouthful, we need to divide them up into groups or families. So each family or group of snakes has some characteristics that they have in common. And we are gonna take a look at those. Um, and then we'll also look at a couple of examples of species that fit into each family. So the first family of snakes we are gonna look at are pythons. Um, we can see a python here on your screen. So some characteristics that all pythons share is that they are non-venomous. So there are not any venomous pythons. Um, they all lay eggs. So I know earlier when we were talking about eggs, I said that most snakes lay eggs, right? Here in a little bit, you guys will see some snakes that don't lay eggs, but these guys, they do lay eggs. Um, they are constrictors. We'll talk about that more here in just a little bit. They have pit organs. Again, we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. And they have two lungs. So we're going to go more into depth on a couple of those things here in just a second when we take a look at a snake from this group or from this family. So lucky for you guys, I actually brought a python with me today. So he will make an appearance in just a second. Um, I'm going to pull him out and we'll take a look at him and see what makes him a python. So if you guys wanna hang in there for just a second, I'm going to go ahead and pull my friend out so that way you can see him. Them. All right. All right. Let me get him all ready for you guys. And then we'll see if we can zoom in on him just a little bit, maybe focus in so that way you guys can see him pretty well. Um, I'll hold him up like this. So this is Mr. Kaw and Kaw is a ball python. So earlier there was a slide um, that you guys probably saw on your screen that said ball python. So that is what type of snake he is. So Mr. Kaw here is a male ball python. Um, when we are talking about pythons, there's a couple different things we are going to look at. So like we said earlier, um, they have heat pits. So heat pits are little holes that he has on his top lip. It may be pretty hard to see here, but in just a minute, you guys will get to see a picture of a ball python and hopefully be able to see some of those heat pits. So what those heat pits are, are they are um, little tools that our python friends will use to pick up on heat. So Mr. Kaw here, like we talked about earlier, snakes, they are really, really good at smelling their prey and finding them that way. But another way that they will find prey is by using those heat pits. So what it does is it gives him basically infrared vision almost, and it allows him to see the heat from his prey. So he uses his sense of smell and that also that um, heat finding tool or those heat pits on his lip to help him find his prey. We can see he is sticking his tongue out right now. He's kind of smelling around. Um, when we are talking about ball pythons, they are a very, very cool species. They get their name ball pythons from the fact that when they feel threatened um, or if they are ready to go into their burrow, they will roll up into a cinnamon roll shape or a ball. And that is where they get the name ball python from, which is pretty awesome. These guys are also called royal pythons sometimes. And that is because way back in the day, these guys uh, actually were kind of worn as jewelry, which sounds kind of crazy, but they like to curl around things um, and hang on like that. So people used to wear them as jewelry. Um, a lot of people that had a lot of money, um, and that is why they're called royal pythons, which is pretty awesome. So Mr. Kaw here, he is native to Africa, specifically the African savanna. So if we think about the African savanna, we're thinking grassland, a lot of dry, brown, yellow colored grass. And when we look at Kaw, we can tell by his colors that he would camouflage in really, really well. 
He has a lot of brown, a lot of tan, um, a couple of little black spots on him. So he would blend in really, really well in the savanna grass. These guys, when they are in the savanna, they are going to be living in abandoned mammal burrows. So if you guys don't know what a burrow is, it is basically a hole in the ground. Um, so if we're talking about abandoned mammal burrows, we're talking about burrows that were dug by small mammals out in the savanna. And then those mammals left those burrows behind and they went and lived somewhere else. And then we have our ball pythons here like Mr. Caw that would find those burrows and that's where they would live. Um, these guys, like all snakes, are carnivorous. So that means that they eat meat, right? So Mr. Caw here in the African savanna, we can kind of think in our heads what types of things that he would eat. He's going to be eating all sorts of rodents, birds, anything that he can find on the ground that he could fit into his mouth. So um, these guys are non-venomous because remember our python friends are non-venomous snakes, right? But they have very, very special, um, unique teeth for a non-venomous snake. They actually have fangs. So most of the time when we see fangs on a snake, that means that they are a venomous snake because those fangs are what they're gonna use to inject their venom into their prey. But these guys are non-venomous. They are actually constrictors. So some of us may have heard the word constrictor before. Um, when we're talking about snakes, constrictor means that um, it's just the way that they eat. So for him, when he eats, what he's gonna do is he's going to bite his prey. He's going to wrap his body around it a couple times. And then when he feels like he's ready to eat, he is going to swallow that prey whole. So if you hear me at some point today say the word constrictor, just know that that's what it means. It means that when they go to eat their food, they're going to wrap their body around it until they're ready to eat, and then they'll swallow it whole, which is pretty awesome. Um, Mr. Ka has some pretty awesome scales on him. So just like other snakes that I talked about earlier, he does shed. Um, he is just about full grown. So he, I want to say right now, is about three or three and a half feet long, which is just about as big as he will get since he is a ball python. That is about the size um, that they'll stop growing. But he still does shed because as they get older, they may not get any longer, but he will get a little bit thicker. He'll get bigger around. So he still has to shed those scales in order to grow and be able to be nice and comfortable in his body which is pretty awesome. So I'm going to get you guys one last look at Mr. Caw here before he goes away. We'll see if we can zoom in a little bit on him. He's a very awesome guy. <laughs> there he is. He's looking at you guys right in the camera. There we go. Cool. All right. You guys want to wave bye to Mr. Caw before I put him away? I'm going to say bye. Awesome. Good job, guys. All right. I'm going to go ahead and put him away. And then we will move on to our next snakes. But while I put him away, let's see maybe if we can pop a picture of the ball python back on the screen. And you guys might be able to see those heat pits a little bit better. There we go. Cool. Yeah. So you guys can see those little holes on that top lip. Those are those heat pits that I was talking about. And there are a couple other um, types of snakes that also have heat pits. And we will take a look at some of those guys here in just a little bit. All right. Cool. So uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to another group or another family of snakes. This is our second family we're talking about today, and that would be vipers. So vipers are all venomous, meaning that they have some pretty long things that they use to inject their prey with their venom. Um, they use this venom as their main method of catching prey. So remember, we talked just a little bit ago about constrictors, right? But these guys are going to use venom to hunt. So for them, it is pretty efficient because it does not take a lot of energy to um, bite their prey with their venom compared to some other ways that they could catch their prey like um, constrictors do, right? So vipers have some pretty stocky bodies and they have really, really big heads compared to their body size. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple species of vipers. So the first viper species that we're going to look at is called a gaboon viper. Gaboon vipers are native to the rainforests of Africa, and they are some of the largest vipers that can be found in the continent of Africa. They can get up to about six feet long, and just like other vipers, their heads can get really big because they have to have some space to store their venom. So if we look towards the back of that viper's head, we can see it kind of gets pretty big back there, and that's because that's where their venom is stored um, in their venom sacs. 
So some of the largest gaboon vipers have heads over six inches wide. So that's like half a foot. That's crazy. And they have the longest fangs of any venomous snakes. That's also really crazy. Um, these snakes are really, really well adapted to their habitat, specifically with their camouflage pattern. So they spend a lot of time on the forest floor um, in Africa where there's a lot of leaf litter. So there's a lot of dead leaves. And in order to catch prey, these snakes have to be really, really stealthy and they have to use their camouflage to help them achieve this. We are gonna go ahead and move on to another snake, another species of viper. Um, another one we are going to look at is going to be the eyelash viper. These guys are so, so cool. Um, they are native to Southern Mexico and their range can extend down into Central America too. These snakes get their name from the eyelash looking scales that they have right above their eyes. You guys might be able to see it in the picture here. Um, they have some really, really rough scales that stick out of their body and they're pretty sharp. So those scales help to protect them as they climb through the forest that they live in. And it also, while they're climbing, might help them to grip onto the trees um, and all of the branches that they are climbing through too. Um, they are what we call an arboreal species, which means that they spend a lot of time in the trees. So again, those scales are really gonna help them out as they're climbing. Um, since they are an arboreal species, their diet is going to mostly consist of things like birds, um, frogs, lizards, and then other small animals that they can find around the trees um, in the forests. So we are going to look at one more viper. And the last viper that we're going to look at today is called the Eastern Copperhead. Uh, a lot of us are probably pretty familiar with these guys, especially if we live in the United States. Um, so these guys are native to the United States, even here in Missouri, where I'm from. Um, they can reach about four and a half feet long, and they are one of the most common venomous snakes here in the United States. Um, they can be easily identified by their reddish, coppery coloring and their marks on their backs, which are often described as being Hershey kiss shaped. So we can see uh, on this picture here, that snake has some markings on its back that kind of look like Hershey kisses. Do you guys think they look like it? Yeah, I agree. So these guys are a type of pit viper, which means that they have heat pits. So remember the heat pits that you guys saw on our ball python? These guys also have heat pits. So again, that gives them an infrared-like vision that helps them to detect the body heat of their prey. Something else that's really cool about these guys is that when they hatch from their egg, the tip of their tail is actually green. And this can help them to lure in prey when they're younger, since they're so small, sometimes they have a little bit of trouble finding prey um, that they can take down since they are so small, but that green tail helps to lure in that prey. And then when they get older and they start to mature um, and they start shedding more often, the green on their tail will fade away and then it will just turn the same color as the rest of their body, which is pretty cool. Um, we are gonna go ahead and move on to another group or another family of snakes, which are boas and anacondas. So these guys are non-venomous, which means that they do not have any fangs. Remember, um, some of our python friends, they have fangs, even though they are not venomous. But these guys, they don't have fangs. Um, they all are live bearing, which means that they do not lay eggs. So I remember earlier when I said most snakes lay eggs, most of them do. These guys, they don't. So they will give live birth to their young. Um, a few of them have pit organs, just like our viper friends. Um, and of course, like Mr. Caw. Um, and then all of these snakes are constrictors. So remember that means that they're gonna wrap around their prey and then they'll eat it just like pythons. Um, and they'll squeeze pretty tight until their prey stops breathing. And then they're gonna swallow it whole, which is pretty different from our venomous snakes, right? The ones that have fangs, yeah. So all boas also have two lungs. And then we can find these species mostly in South America. So the first snake from this group that we're going to take a look at is the green anaconda. These guys are native to South America and they are the heaviest snakes in the world. They can reach lengths of about 30 feet, which is about the length of a school bus. I want you to think about that for a second. I'm sure a lot of us have seen school buses around. Maybe we've even ridden in a school bus, right? Imagine seeing a snake the same size as a school bus in length. It's crazy. So these guys are very, very strong swimmers. 
and they spend a lot of time in rivers and then other bodies of water that they can find in their habitats. Because of their size, they can eat a really, really big variety of animals like birds, fish, and then even mammals like deer and capybara. Um, most of the time, they're going to be smaller deer and smaller capybara, but they can still eat them, which is pretty crazy. Um, the next snake that we're going to look at, we're going to go ahead and move on, is the Brazilian rainbow boa. I'm going to tell you guys right now, this is my favorite snake species ever. I love them. But before I tell you where these snakes get their name from, I want you guys in the chat box to tell me why you think they're called rainbow boas. So I'll give you guys a minute to think about it and a minute to type. Why are these called rainbow boas? I'll give you guys a hint. If you look really, really closely at the picture, you might be able to see why they're called rainbow boas. See if you guys can get it in your chat box. Looks like I'm starting to get some answers. Yeah, I see some people that have the right answer. Yep, you guys are on the right track. Let me give you guys just a little bit longer. Type that in your chat box. Why are they called rainbow boas? Awesome. All right, I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys. So they're called rainbow boas because their scales refract light and they make a really pretty rainbow color, which you can kind of see in the picture. So when these snakes are under direct sunlight, they're very, very iridescent and they look fantastic. They're really rainbow colored. Um, these guys can be found in the Amazon rain. Hello, I cannot talk today. The Amazon River Basin in South America. And they spend a lot of their time in trees, which makes them an arboreal species. So if you ever hear me say arboreal, or if you ever hear the word arboreal, that means that it's an animal or a species of animal that spends a lot of time in the trees. So these guys have some pretty awesome markings on their side. Um, you can see here in the picture, and they those markings kind of look like eyes, which is really cool. So um, scientists, their best guess as to why the rainbow boas look like this is because they um, think that it may be like a defense tactic. So that way, when other animals see them, they see a whole bunch of eyes and they might get a little freaked out and go find dinner elsewhere. So that's a really, really cool thing about these guys. Um, let's take one last really, really good look at our rainbow boa here and how amazing it looks. And we're gonna go ahead and move on to another group of snakes. You guys ready? Awesome, okay. So next we're gonna talk about elapids. Elapids are all venomous. So every single elapid that we can think of, they're all venomous. Um, and they are very, very unique from other snakes. So um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, and unlike vipers, which have folding or hinged fangs, so vipers, their fangs will fold down or hinge when they close their mouth. Elapids, their fangs are pretty short and they're called fixed fangs. So that means that whenever they close their mouth, those fangs don't fold, they stay right where they're at. And those fangs are what they're gonna use to take down their prey. Um, we are going to go ahead and take a look at some snakes from this group. The first snake we're going to take a look at is called the banded sea crate. So this snake can be found in coral reefs in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and they have a really unique striped pattern on their body that helps them to blend in with their surroundings. So I'm sure you guys have all seen pictures of coral reefs, but they're really, really colorful and vibrant and shockingly, those stripes blend in really, really well, and they help those um, sea crates to stay nice and camouflaged and hidden and protect them from predators. So these snakes are really amazing swimmers, and they actually have a paddle-shaped tail. So the end of their tail is really flat, and that helps to propel them through the water. Um, and then since they live underwater most of the time, they can get a lot of salt water in their body, so they can accumulate a lot of salt water. Um, and they're actually really well adapted to deal with this. So they have a gland under their tongue that allows them to expel or to get rid of all of the extra salt that they might have in their body. Um, since these snakes spend so much time underwater, they can go a really, really long time without breathing. So normally they can go about 30 minutes without breathing. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely cannot go 30 minutes without breathing. These snakes are super talented. But um, not only can they normally hold their breath for about 30 minutes, they can actually, in scenarios where they need to, go an upwards of two 
hours without breathing, which is insane to me, right? Imagine being underwater for two whole hours and not breathing. That's crazy, right? These guys are very, very awesome, very unique elapids. We are going to go ahead and take a look at another elapid. Um, so the next elapid we're going to take a look at is the king cobra. So these guys are native to India and China. And the name king cobra comes from the fact that these snakes can actually eat other cobras, which makes them the king of cobras. That's where they get their name, king cobra, right? These snakes have what is called a hood. Um, which is the skin that sticks out on either side of their head. So if we look at our snake here on the screen, we can see that he's got a little piece of skin on either side of his head, and that is called his hood. So the hood is a technique that cobras use to defend themselves against predators and also other snakes. So it makes them look really big and scary. And it's going to scare away all of their predators and other snakes. Um, cobras, like other lapids, are venomous. Um, and they have things that are about half an inch long, so about six inches, which is pretty long. Um, something really cool about cobras is that scientists have actually studied their venom, and there have been um, pain relieving medications that they've been able to make um, from studying that venom that will help out with things like arthritis and nerve pain, which is really awesome. Um, we are going to go ahead and move on to our last elapid. And that is going to be the death adder. So these guys are much stockier and much bigger than other species of elapid, which makes them look a lot like vipers, right? So we remember our viper friends, they are really big. They have really big heads. And um, if we think back to maybe our gaboon viper we saw earlier, this guy looks kind of similar. Um, death adders are found in the forest floors of Australia and New Guinea and they are going to lure prey closer by wiggling their tail like a worm. So they'll take, their they'll take their tail and they will wiggle it around and maybe try to draw in some prey. And then of course, when that prey comes closer, they're going to grab it and take a bite. So these guys are so super venomous and um, other harmless animals like lizards. So for example, a blue tongue skink, they're gonna try to mimic them to trick predators into thinking that they are dangerous, which is really crazy. So we are going to go ahead and switch over and take a look at one last group of snakes. And those are the colubrids. So colubrids are the largest group or the largest family of snakes out of all families of snakes. So colubrids are mostly non-venomous. And um, there are a couple of exceptions to this rule, but um, what makes the few venomous species of colubrids unique is that their fangs are um, pretty different than other snake fangs. So venomous colubrids are what we call rear fanged because their venom flows out of grooves in their teeth that are found in the back of their mouths. So most of the snakes that we've talked about today, actually all of them so far, um, are front fanged, which means their fangs are in the front of their mouth way up here, and their venom will come out of those fangs. But these guys, if they are venomous, the venom is coming out in the back of their mouth, which is really crazy. So when rear fang snakes bite their prey, um, they do it a lot of times, they'll do it several times in order to get out enough venom to actually take down their prey. Um, one other thing that's pretty shocking about this group of snakes is that all of the species in this group, so all colubrids, only have one lung, which is really crazy. Um, so, if you guys are ready, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at some colubrids and see if we can recognize any of the species that are on here. The first colubrid that we are going to take a look at is called the speckled king snake. Speckled king snakes are found here in the central and southern regions of the United States. And just like king cobras, which we saw earlier, these snakes get their name because they are the king of snakes. So they have been known to eat other snakes, even venomous snakes like copperheads and rattlesnakes, which is really, really crazy because these guys aren't even venomous at all. They're non-venomous snakes. So these guys um, also have the nickname salt and pepper snakes. We can kind of see why when we look at them, they have a salt and peppery type pattern to them. Um, they aren't actually black and white like salt and pepper, but it kind of looks like it from the top. They're actually like a yellow and black color, but they still have that really speckly salt and pepper looking marking on them. Um, and then, we are gonna go ahead and move on to the next colubrid. And this one is super duper fun. Um, this is called a flying snake. 
Um, they can be found in the forests of Southeast Asia, and despite their name, they cannot actually fly, but they can glide. So these guys, um, I guess they should be called gliding snakes, not flying snakes, but that's all right. It's a really fun name. Um, they can glide in upwards of 300 feet from treetops in their habitat. So imagine if you were walking around in the forest and you saw a snake flying above you and they can glide about 300 feet depending on how far they're trying to glide, which is crazy. Um, so they're able to glide or to fly by tightening up the muscles on their stomachs. So they will tighten up those muscles um, nice and tight and actually will flatten their body out. And it allows them to drift through the air, makes them more aerodynamic. Um, and it makes it to where they can even glide at speeds up to 25 miles an hour, which is absolutely crazy. So they're gonna use this um, gliding adaptation to help them escape predators and then also to help them catch prey. All right, so I have given you guys some amazing information about some amazing snake species. So now we're gonna do a little bit of snake trivia since you guys are now snake experts. What do you guys think? Think you can do it? I think you guys can do it. You guys are experts now, right? So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna give you a snake statement is what I'm gonna call them. And I want you to tell me whether that snake statement is true or false. And you're gonna do that using your chat box, okay? So go ahead and open up those chat boxes and get ready. Are you guys ready? All right, here we go. So our first snake statement is, baby venomous snakes are more dangerous than adults. So you're gonna tell me in your chat box whether you think that statement is true or whether you think it's false. So you'll type true or false, okay? So I'll say it one more time for you guys. Baby venomous snakes are more dangerous than adults. So you'll tell me true or false. Let's see what you guys come up with. And you guys are already starting to send some answers in. All right, let me see. Ooh, all right, I see some people saying true. Some people saying false. Yeah, a lot of us are starting to get it. You guys are rocking it. Look at you. All right, so we're going to go ahead and show you the answer. The answer is false. So there is no biological evidence that backs up this claim. So baby snakes are smaller. Um, and this means their fangs and their venom glands are actually smaller too. So they're not actually capable of producing venom that is more potent than an adult. So this would lead to more work for them, and then it would be a lot less energy efficient for them, which if we know anything about animals, they wanna make sure that whatever they're doing is very energy efficient because they are trying to survive out in the wild, right? So they don't wanna do anything that takes up a lot of energy. All right, you guys ready for our next snake statement? Here we go, cool. So our next snake statement is, if a snake vibrates or rattles its tail, it is venomous. So go ahead and tell me in your chat box, true or false, if you think that if a snake vibrates or rattles its tail, it is venomous. I'll give you guys just a second to go ahead and type that out for me. True or false? All right, a lot of us are starting to get some answers in. Yep, okay. I'm seeing some trues, some falses. You guys are kind of split down the middle. All right, I'll give you just a couple more seconds here. We'll see what you come up with. All right, are we ready? Okay, here we go. So if you said false, you would be correct. So yes, it's true that rattlesnakes are venomous and they will vibrate their tail, but there are a lot of species out there that are harmless or non-venomous and they will shake their tails or vibrate their tails um, as a self-defense mechanism. So they do this to seem more dangerous and they'll use it as a warning to predators or other snakes to stay away. So they will actually sometimes rattle their tail in a pile of leaves and that actually makes it sound like a real rattlesnake, which is kind of crazy. So if you were a snake, you wanna make sure you have a way to tell other snakes and predators to stay away, right? So that's a really creative way that they have been able to mimic rattlesnakes or try to copy them to see if they can scare away those predators by acting like a rattlesnake, which is pretty awesome. All right, so if you guys are ready, we are going to move on to our last snake statement. 
So our last snake statement is we benefit from having snakes around. So you are going to tell me in your chat box, true or false, if we benefit from having snakes around. True or false? I'll give you guys just a couple more seconds to type. Just a couple more seconds. Looks like we've got some answers coming in. We see some trues, some falses. A lot of us are on the right track here. Give you just a couple more seconds before we move on. All right. You guys ready? Okay. So this statement, this snake statement is true. So humans benefit so, so much from snakes. So one reason for this is because snakes are free pest control. So they help keep mice and rat and other rodent populations down, which is really awesome. And it's a major benefit to us. So mice and rats sometimes can carry diseases. Um, they can destroy household items. And sometimes they're just kind of dirty. So thanks to snakes, we really don't have to worry about their populations getting way out of control. Um, so we should say thank you to snakes for that. Another reason that we benefit from snakes is because they contribute a lot to science and medical research. So venom is actually beneficial to people, which is kind of shocking because most of the time when we think of venom, we think that it's really scary and it's gonna hurt us, right? But their venom can actually be used as medicine, which is really awesome. So um, depending on what type of snake we're talking about, um, some venoms can treat cancer. They can do um, a lot of work with high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes, um, even things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and a lot of other diseases too. So we're still learning more and more about the benefits of snake venom every day, which is super awesome. That's why science is pretty cool. We come up with new stuff every day, right? So now that I've had the chance to ask you guys some questions, I want you guys to ask me some questions. So if you have any questions about what we learned today or about anything else snake related, now is your time to ask. So I want to just say thank you guys for learning with me today. And remember, if you have any questions, use that chat box and let me know what those questions are and I will answer them for you. All right. Thank you so much, Ashlyn, and, uh, and to all the amazing snakes we got a chance to see today. Um, I know we're getting close to dinner time for uh, for a lot of folks. It's a school night and all those kind of things. We got a couple pretty common ones that uh, that came up that I definitely want to hit. One is um, we use the word venom and venomous quite a bit. And, and a few people were asking, hey, is that the same thing as poison? If not, how are venom and poison different? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. Yeah. So anytime we are talking about snakes, we're talking about venomous snakes. So um, I know a lot of us, when we think about venom and poison, we may think they're the same, but they're actually very, very different. And different animals will use those in different ways. So if we are thinking about poison for a second, poison is something that if we eat it or we touch it, we might get sick, right? We're talking about venom. Venom either has to be um, injected into us, um, and that is how we know that it's venom, right? So if something bites me or stings me, if it has fangs or a stinger, and it makes me sick, that's how I know that it's venomous. So we're talking about snakes, right? They are biting with their venom, so that would make it venom. If we're talking about something like a frog, where if we touch it, it makes us sick, that's how we know that it's poisonous, right? Pretty cool. So that is the main difference between venom and poison. Awesome. A little bit of an offense versus defense kind of a situation. Yeah, so, of course. Um, thank you. And thanks to all of you for asking such uh, such great questions. Another really common one um, was that uh, was related to the, you know, the seasons, I guess. So you know, some people were talking seasons. Other people were saying, you know, hey, it's pretty crazy. We see them in a lot of hotter environments, but now we see them, you know, at the bottom of the ocean and, and uh, some of those things are coral reefs. Um, so uh, people, you know, a few people want to know, are there any winter snakes or cold weather snakes? Or if not, how do they survive cold weather if, uh, if it happens to get really cold in some of these environments where we know they are? Of course, that's an amazing question. So um, I want you guys to think if you live in a cold area, you probably don't see a whole lot of snakes around in the wintertime, right? I don't know. I've never really seen a snake in the winter. Um, and that's because when snakes are living in an area that's really cold, remember, they're cold-blooded or ectothermic, right? 
So they have to rely on their environment to help keep them warm and toasty. So if you were a snake in the wintertime, you would not want to be outside in the snow, in the cold where it's getting below freezing, right? It's definitely not a place you want to be. So snakes are going to find a spot um, where they can actually do what's called brumation. So brumation is like hibernation, but it's for reptiles. So a lot of other reptiles will brumate. So things like turtles, tortoises, um, lizards, they will brumate as well. So we will find these guys a lot of the time burrowed down in the ground. Um, sometimes they will be under rocks and logs and things like that. And that is their main way of staying warm in the winter time. So when they brumate, um, they are slowing down those body processes that they run most of the time. So their, um, what am I thinking of? Their metabolism, that's the word. Metas their metabolism will slow down a lot more than what it normally is. And that will help to make sure that they can kind of keep their energy levels pretty consistent as they go through the winter time, which is pretty cool. It is pretty amazing that the adaptations that allow some of these animals, we had a, a whole, if you're a varsity student learning member, we did a whole class um, maybe a year or so ago about winter adaptations you'll find in on your learning member account. Um, you guys may be able to find it on our YouTube channel. And, and some of the things, you know, some was it a, a certain kind of frog just freezes in a block of ice and yes. just slows down its metabolism yep. and to be able to, to get through. So, uh, so pretty amazing. And thank you. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for those, those questions and all that. Now, for those of us who don't roommate, uh, and may have winter vacations and things coming up. We have a lot of questions about really two things. Uh, one is the wildlife and uh, what else we can see there. And then Mr. Ka, could we come see Mr. Ka? If we go there, will we be able to meet him? And then how did Mr. Ka get his name? So I guess a three-part question, how did Mr. Ka get his name? If we come to Wonders of Wildlife, can we meet him? And, uh, and what else will we be able to see uh, if we come visit? Of course, yeah. So Ka got his name. Um, he's actually named after the snake in the jungle book. So the snake in the jungle book, his name is Ka. He's definitely a different type of snake than the Ka that I showed you guys today. But I think it's also a pretty cool name. So that's where he got his name from. Um, Ka is one of our education ambassador animals. So what that means is that he is not on display in the aquarium, but we use him for a lot of our education programming. So things like birthday parties, homeschool programs, live animal programs, and then even programs like Varsity, which we're doing right now, Varsity Tutors, which is super awesome. So he is a snake with a job is what I like to call him. So he gets to um, teach other people about snakes and about his species specifically. Um, and so if you came to Wonders of Wildlife, if you are in one of our programs, you might get to see Mr. Cobb, but you wouldn't see him if you were walking through the aquarium. Um, he is a pretty spoiled guy. <laughs> He's got the whole enclosure to himself, back of house. Um, and he is a pretty awesome ambassador for his species. Um, if you come to Wonders of Wildlife, we have a ton of animals for you guys to see. Um, we have a whole bunch of other reptiles and especially a lot of other snakes. So um, in our aquarium, we have a copperhead. We have um, a pygmy rattlesnake. We have some black rat snakes. We have some corn snakes and we even have a green anaconda, which remember we talked about earlier is the biggest, as far as weight goes, species of snake which out there, which is pretty awesome. Well, thank you. All kinds of great reasons to, to come visit Wonders of Wildlife. And of course, you know, you mentioned that there are opportunities to get involved with Mr. Ka. So, uh, so like I mentioned, we've got cool programs all the time with Wonders of Wildlife and, uh, and other amazing educational institutions here at Varsity Tutors. So on our way out, we want to give you guys some information about how to connect with some of those things. Also how to connect with Wonders of Wildlife because uh, I'm planning a birthday party for uh, for a kid pretty soon. I, if Mr. Ka does birthday parties, I need to go check out that. So we've got he information up here parties. on your screen on the way out so you guys can <laughs> Get in, get in touch with uh, with both of us and find all kinds of amazing ways to learn amazing things like we did today. So, Ashlyn, to you, to Mr. Cod, everyone at Wonders Wildlife, thank you so much for uh, for giving us all this amazing information about uh, snakes. Getting uh, up close in person with Mr. Cod. To all of you out there, thank you for such great questions and participation. This was a whole lot of fun. So, uh, so let's do it again soon. So, thanks, everybody. See ya.